Agriculture is an industry based on natural resources, and if we deplete the natural resources, they will be gone. When supply goes down, price goes up. I go to a grocery store and your shelf will be like empty. It used to be full, right? Apples were $4.99 and now they're like $6.99. The whole poverty question is about poverty. It's not about the price of food. The number of people using food banks at any point in time is a mere fraction of the number of people who are food insecure. We need to deal with poverty at its root. I've reached the point now where I just buy whatever's on sale rather than buying what I preferred to eat. Attack of the Clones. Uh, more like Attack of the Extremely Expensive Avocados. Hey, JN, do you think that Darth Vader ever had to worry about his grocery bill? Probably not. The first episode of The Thread, we talked about how expensive it was to find a place to live, whether that was buying or living. And now the conversation is moving to the cost of food. Whenever I go to the grocery store, it seems as if the food is costing more and more. That is, if I can find the thing that I'm looking for. Yeah, and I'm not just seeing it at the grocery store. I'm seeing it at restaurants and coffee shops. Like this past weekend, I went to the restaurant and literally saw every single price scratched out with new updated prices. So makes you rethink when you are spending your money for sure. Supply issues have been on the news a lot lately and I think a lot of us, I know myself, I didn't realize how complicated it was to get uh, how food gets into the grocery stores and then gets into the plate uh, in my home. For sure, it's super intricate if you look at the supply chain, right? Like, there are labor shortages due to COVID. Then if we take a step back, there are these extreme climate events that have hit the agricultural sector as well. All right, I got to hop onto a call with Erin Kelly from ASI to talk to her about what Polly, her artificial intelligence, has to say about this. And it's nice to see you again. I think from the beginning of the pandemic, one of the things that's changed a lot uh, with our society is our relationship with food. What does Polly see in a relationship with food since the pandemic? Well, the pandemic has encouraged us to be a lot more thoughtful about uh, where our food comes from and how reliable it is and how much we can count on it. So we no longer take it for granted that we can just go to a store and have something. Do we have a better understanding of how our food ends up on the grocery shelves or it ends up in our refrigerators? No, I still don't think people understand the complexity of it because there's a real push toward a buy local movement and a buy organic and to buy organic often it's local. It's a movement that had already had roots before COVID. People were starting to say, well, I'd rather go to farmer's markets, buy directly from the producer. They felt that they might get healthier food that way because it's not being shipped and stayed in storage or frozen and then shipped and thawed. Climate was also a talking point as well. Are people concerned with how climate is affecting agriculture? The effect of climate change on food is the second biggest worry that we saw when we were looking at people's discussions, especially in this last year, after we've had the wildfires and the heat waves in BC and the floods, we're seeing high anxiety that these things could happen here in Ontario and the effects of climate change and whether or not the government is preparing for that and doing the right things. And people are aware that some of the price increases that we've had this year have been because of the extreme weather that we've had throughout the country and in other places. It's heightened the feeling people have that, that Canada's supply chain is fragile. So people see it as vulnerable. And when it comes to solution, uh, Polly found that people really do want a government action plan uh, related to climate change and agriculture, right? You know, just before COVID, there was a lot of movement with, you know, Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion and many other groups. And they definitely had a big influence spurring people on, especially young people, to take action, become activists, change their diet, become vegan, um, start to think about where their food comes from and to lobby governments to prioritize climate change. Um, the young generation is really up to speed on regenerative <laughs> agriculture um, and digital transformation in the agriculture industry. So 
what emotion did Polly find uh, around food insecurity and poverty? What we're really seeing is for people who are um, lower income, they're making those sacrifices in the healthy eating choices. So they're buying the more processed food. They're, they're having to make choices. Can I afford fruit and vegetables or fresh fruit and vegetables? And often the answer is no. But we're actually seeing in the conversations, it's really very middle class people are not able to buy whatever they want at the grocery store. There's anxiety. And, and the reason there's anxiety is because you get the sense that the government doesn't really have control over it. We're in Cambridge, here to speak to Simon Samoji, one of the authors of Canada's Food Price Report 2022. Do you find that at this time, this moment in time, uh, more than any other time, maybe within the last 20 years, mm -hmm. more people are talking about food? Definitely. I think we're in a situation with the pandemic where people have gone to their grocery stores, they've seen not the products that are usually on the shelves there and they're thinking, well, why is this happening? And we've spent a lot of our time explaining the way food gets to people's plates. Uh, it becomes imported, we, we make it, we have processes that make it, uh, we have grocery stores that sell it and how interconnected the system is. So it's, it's been a very um, important time for the understanding of, of the food industry and the food system as a whole. People uh, would go to the grocery store, they might not be able to find what they usually buy. Things are costing more than uh, usual. In what ways is the supply chain going to affect prices in 2022? We see typically uh, climate events. We see weather events in say places where we get a lot of our food from like California. Uh, they might have a flood or a drought uh, that uh, means there's less supply of things like fruits and vegetables from those places. We saw a, a lot of uh, drought in the prairie provinces uh, recently, uh, and that increased uh, the price of grains because a lot of grains are grown in that part of uh, our country. Uh, and that means that the price to, or well, the cost of baking or making bread is higher because wheat prices are higher or animal feed prices are also higher because of those droughts. And we, we saw, you know, with, with, the, with the pandemic, um, a lack of uh, workers because of they've gotten sick, uh, they can't work, that slows down food processors who need people to be working in the meat processing plants, working in the other different types of food processes. And, and that means there's less product and that increases price. So there's this ecosystem of actions across the globe and they can impact uh, how much it costs to ship a product from one part of the country to another. It feels like the perfect storm, right? The situation that we're uh, sitting in. It's, it's a good, descri good description. It's creating a situation where people are now, in some ways, understanding where our food comes from, the, the, the different businesses and people involved to get that product onto a shelf mm -hmm. for us to buy. And in, in some ways, that's the outcome of the issues isn't great, but in some ways it's good that people are now understanding where our food comes from. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's good to understand so you, that you're a better informed consumer about what you buy. What were your findings regarding consumer demand for sustainability? Yeah, con consumers um, are becoming more and more understanding of the impacts of climate change, not just on themselves, but also on the food production system as a whole. People are, are changing their habits to some extent. They're looking for sustainable options. And I think in, in the coming years, this is going to become even more important. As we, we've seen with a lot of consumer research that we do, that there are a set of particularly millennial and younger consumers who are now coming into the workplace. They now have a lot of money and they're very concerned about the impact of food production on climate change. So there is a driving force within consumers to be very savvy about the products that they buy, particularly young consumers, focusing on those products that are sustainable, that are animal cruelty free. Are there any big picture solutions or policy shifts we need to implement? If we could put more research and development money into building better indoor farming systems or, or developing breeds of vegetables and fruits that grow better and, and, and quicker and in, in indoor environments, we could have more production out of season on our grocery store shelves which in the long term would mean better quality food on the shelves and could also lead to lower prices for consumers.
Joshna, thank you so much for inviting me to your home. How do you think our relationship with food has changed throughout this pandemic? I think that we've gotten closer to our food because we've had to work harder. We've had to do more work to get our hands on the food. And I think to some extent, most of us have been way more involved in cooking it for ourselves. But then on the other side of things, people have had a really negative experience because once uh, working stops, then income decreases, and then food insecurity bursts right through all of that. Well, our artificial intelligence, Polly, mm. uh, pulled this sentiment from people. Okay. Food insecurity is poverty. Uh, as someone who is a chef and a food activist, yes. how do you see it? A hundred percent, right? Uh, hunger is easily a child of poverty. There is no question about it. And we, we collectively need to pay attention to this more. We need to recognize this more. We need to realize that this is a human rights issue. Access to good quality food that nourishes your body properly is in fact a basic human right. Do you think that a lot of us fully understand how our food gets to the table? No, I don't think we do. And I think that that's part of the problem. We are so disconnected from the farm. I think that our ignorance about how the food gets to us is, is a problem because it influences the way we make decisions, right? We think that meat shows up on a styrofoam container wrapped in plastic or that all the apples are gorgeous. We don't know things like um, farmers have to surrender 40% sometimes of their harvest of cucumbers because they're too twisty to fit into a case. They're gorgeous, I didn't know that. right? They're gorgeous, organic, beautiful, cucumbers, but because the case is for 12 and a curly Q cuke is not going to fit in there, that is tossed and not suitable for market. How would you explain the connection between the supply chain and the rising cost of food? Our supply chain and the, the, the management of the supply chain was designed around a very specific mode, you know, let's say. And once anything different happens, like a pandemic, like an emergency, like hoarding, you know, for whatever reason, that sends everything off kilter. Every time I've gone to a store recently, the amount I paid for a pound of butter, it just feels 30, another 30 cents, another 50 cents, another, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Milk is the same. And in some places, animal proteins are starting to tell that same story. Mm -hmm. But I think the really important wisdom here is that for someone like me who shops as close to uh, farmers and the people who produce my food as possible, I have seen no increase in my grocery Can bill, you explain that? Right? Buying directly from a farmer uh, also automatically means buying in season, right? And generally speaking, when food is in season, it is very affordable. Uh, right, so that is one important thing. Eating seasonally really helps. Making the farmer connections uh, helps you get access to better quality food, but it also closes the gap between producer and consumer. The, the other thing that we haven't spoken about is the climate crisis. Yes. What role does that play with the rising cost in food? Uh, it, it's a huge deal. We all need to be thinking so much more about eating in a way that attempts to mitigate climate change. We have to understand that the, like, the transportation of food around the planet is the single largest contributor to greenhouse gases that is impacting climate change. We need to slow down on the amount of food that we drive around, that we ship and fly around this planet because that, that is the stuff that is so dependent on a supply, on a national and international supply chains working well. We need to really understand that our dependency on that sort of tier or level of food is perhaps the most vulnerable way to eat. And once one of those systems fall, we see the kind of wild fluctuations that we're all dealing with right now. We do a lot of gluten-free, but... Like, like that's kind of easy in an indigenous kitchen because we didn't have wheat, so when you start thinking of indigenous food, it's not even on your radar. Why was it important for you to have the fresh food, the healthy food? Um, well, for me in my career, like I, I always like lived abroad and you know worked in different areas, and then when I knew, like when I got older, I wanted to start a family, I wanted to be closer to home. So I decided to start working, you know, closer to home. And one of those things that I, I, I never experienced in other restaurants, but I started experiencing here because you know everybody. Um, you can literally see people's health decline in front of you. That was something that, like, I, I didn't didn't realize that it was affecting me. That How I was, was it like, affecting you? 
I just didn't like seeing it. I'm like, why am I giving you this? And I know you can't have it. And you know, and you start to see those people's health decline. So that was something that really like, it, it got to me. I was lucky enough to have a dad who was a hunter and a fisher and you know, food and culture. And my mom being a seed keeper, all of those things were instilled in me to be important, right? Right from being small. So um, I wanted something different. Mm -hmm. I don't care about French fries. I can get that anywhere. So I wanted a healthier option for my community because gluten is so bad for indigenous people. Dairy is 98% lactose intolerant. So most people don't even know that they're lactose intolerant because they've never known what it's like to eat and not feel sick after. So now when people come, they can try something and it's like, hey, I've never had quinoa before. What is that, right? Oh, wild rice, like real wild rice. Like we're giving indigenous people their palate back. What does it mean to you to be able to feed your community in this way? To me, it's like feeding family, right? Like it's, it's important to me because I want to see my community be healthy, right? You don't want to see people's health declining and knowing it's because of you know, 90% because of what we put in our mouths, right? And this was my opportunity to share that with my community saying, you know what? This is what satiated feels like. Not full satiated, like you're done. You didn't even eat as much as you think you would. Um, just all those feelings are, are important and they're, they were important to me, right? And, and seeing that difference, seeing people come back, seeing people say, you know what? I love that, I could have it. I didn't even know, you know, what full felt like until I came here. A lot of people just can't afford it. They can't afford corn. It's expensive. A, a bag this big is like thirteen fifty. So, you know, if you want to make corn soup for your house and you're a little old lady and it's only you at home, you have forty dollars to make your traditional corn soup. What does Indigenous food sovereignty mean to you? I really don't like that word. <laughs> why not? <laughs> why? Why don't you like that word? Because we're not sovereign. Nobody is. Right. Until we even these little signs, everything, no matter what it is. But at the same time, indigenous people were never against anything that made sense. Anything that helped you was good for everybody. We we're always accepting of new things that made life easier. You know, a huge part of our population was decimated. And then we were kind of thrown into this European lifestyle and, and way of living. You, you mentioned that your uh, dad was a hunter mm -hmm. and uh, that your mom is someone that taught people how to grow food. Like, like to you, me, you... That, that is food sovereignty, right? Walking the walk, not just talking it. Anybody can sit there and tell you a million things about a plant they've never cooked, a plant they've never touched, a plant they've never found outside. Like you go to my mom's garden, you're like, there's weeds everywhere. They're not weeds because we're taught that if it's not a food, it's a medicine. And you might not know what its purpose is, but you also don't know if somebody's gonna come here tomorrow and say, hey, I need that, right? So it's, it's just giving that opportunity just to let nature do what it does. Do you think that that disconnect is part of the reason why people don't know what they should be eating? I think that's a huge disconnect, right? That people don't know because we just haven't been exposed to that or that our, our lifestyles have been so changed that we don't have an opportunity to, um, just to learn about that. So every time you, you try something, that, that's an act of resilience, that's an act of sovereignty, that's an act of taking your culture back. Hey, Nam, how was your chat with Joshna? Joshna was great. I could talk to her like all day long. Joshna and Chef Tanya have very similar views on food justice and food sovereignty. And you know, I think throughout this whole thing, we've all had to make a uh, little adjustments with not just what we're eating, but also what we're getting at the grocery store. Yeah, that seems that way for sure. I'm actually about to head out to Kendall Hill Farms, which is located between Oshawa and Peterborough. David Cranenberg runs a farm and a local market there that uses regenerative techniques, aiming to keep things sustainable. But one thing that sticks out is he talks about this thing, this concept called the future of food is small. So I'm interested to talk to him about that as well. So, you know, Jan, I've been getting a food box throughout the pandemic. It comes every two weeks. I'm always getting new vegetables. I'm not I'm really a big vegetable person, but this food box has introduced me to new vegetables. It's fresher than the stuff you'd get at the grocery store. Plus, uh, when we buy the box, uh, it's also helping the people in our community. It's actually a great idea. I might get on that as well. OK, I have to get on the road. You're off to Kitchener Waterloo, right? Yeah, we just finished loading up the van. I'm on my way to speak to Kamel Ahmed, uh, who started the community fridge KW with his friend Angel. We're seeing a lot of community fridges pop up uh, throughout the province. And although they're great, it makes me wonder, why has government allowed the responsibility to fall on individuals or the charity sector to fill in the gaps uh, when we talk about food insecurity?
My name is Kamil Ahmed and I'm an organizer with Community Fridge KW. Did you start the Community Fridge? In the summer of 2020 when the pandemic was kind of at its peak and was uh, kind of sweeping through our city streets and, and you know, hurting the most vulnerable in our communities, we were inspired by mutual aid movements across Canada and we saw community fridges going up in Regina and in Calgary and we said there's no reason we can't bring that here and these problems are in fact in our backyard, these people are in fact our neighbours and you know, just as long as we ignore them and we continue on with our lives, they will come to a point where we can no longer go on with our lives without being a witness. Mm. Uh, and I think the pandemic did that. I think it brought us to a point where those of us who walked around the city streets or who navigated these communities without paying attention to those who have little, I think we're forced to see them more clearly. So how does the community fridge work? Yeah, so it's open 24 seven. It's a public repository of fresh donated food and essential items that people can take from at any time. So we're just plugging ourselves into that supply chain saying there's a gap here. We're not gonna wait for systems to address this gap because we don't know how long that's gonna take and our neighbors are struggling right now. Uh, so it's kind of stepping into that chain and saying, we will work with local businesses, local farms, local organizations, local vendors, mm -hmm. uh, and we will make sure that they have a source to place their food. It's a recognition that power moves horizontally and there will be times when all of us can give and take. And when a neighbor comes to the fridge and doesn't find it too full, they, they understand that this is food that our neighbors could share today. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow there will be more food. There might be a neighbor who can give more tomorrow. I love what you said that power moves horizontally because, yeah. um, you know, when we think about food costs, sometimes we don't yeah. think about like sanitary pads yeah. or razors. Yeah. How do you meet those needs? Yeah, I think when we first got started, it was very like, uh, food bank mindset like the stuff that food banks want which is you know uh, kind of the classic food drive stuff we've all done in schools non-perishables mm -hmm. it's kind of that we were expecting those types of donations and very quickly we realized that what people really need in our community is fresh produce especially in the winter months and as well as menstrual products and hygiene products especially during covid our artificial intelligence Polly pulled this sentiment from people food insecurity is poverty uh, is that how you also view it? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. But for us at the community fridges, if you're passing by and you haven't had a decent breakfast that day, for whatever reason, you might have had one yesterday, but for whatever reason you didn't have one today, stop by, grab some food. So uh, we would say that people who are hungry are, are experiencing poverty. It's an essential need. I think a lot of us are familiar with food banks, but now we see a lot of community fridges in Toronto, Hamilton, Guelph, Northern Ontario. And it's really great to see people looking out for each other. But why has it come to this? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, almost a philosophical question. It's like, why are humans reactionary beings and why do we wait for things to get so bad? I think part of that is being witness, right? Uh, so many things that are ailments to, the, to human society have, have been removed from our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and even poverty, like so many of us feel so separated from it. It's not here, it's there, right? It's over there. And even in our backyards, a lot of folks will refer to that as over there because it's not in their front yard per se. Why do you think the government has left food insecurity, it seems, solely to the charity sector? As volunteers and organizers, we often have this conversation of, we're happy to do this work, but we wish we didn't have to. It shouldn't be on neighbors to take care of something as fundamental to human existence as food. We need someone to address supply chain issues. We need to talk about why we're not getting food to everybody when we have so much of it, right? It's a complex issue that I think the government isn't, um, that I don't think any government will ever be willing to confront because it's not something you can solve in a four year period. It's not something that you can show, uh, you know, uh, ROI for. It's not something that you can prove to your um, party that you've solved because that's not something that gonna, that's gonna be solved overnight. I'm very curious uh, about your journey to okay. this farm. Of course, you have the family connection as well, but how did your journey uh, to <laughs> this farm sort of start? I went to the University of Guelph, but not for agriculture. While I was there, I helped form a national charity called Meal Exchange, which was looking at hunger and food insecurity. And that's where my journey into the deficiencies of our food system really began where I started looking at, well, why do people not have access to healthy food on a daily or monthly basis? Um, how do you increase access to healthy food? 
How, like, how do you work with farmers to achieve that? Mm -hmm. What are the environmental and social costs and health costs of our current food system? And what are the creative ways we could be addressing these things? You've said that the future of food is small. Correct. What do you mean exactly by that? Yeah, so when I say the future of food is small, it's two things. One is there's a recognition that even our current food system, like if you look at it globally, is small. By some estimates, um, I believe it's like 70% of food that is for human consumption is produced by small farms globally. And I think that can also be the future. If we actually support small farms, in growing to their full potential. Small farms are actually producing like more food per acre or even more calories per acre than their large scale counterparts. And that almost all of that food is actually produced for people to eat versus say biofuels and non-food uses of some of the large scale like monoculture industrial ones. And that small farms also um, are able to do all of this while using less resources and reducing kind of some of the negative social and environmental costs of the food system. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the regenerative farming. Yes. For people who don't know, like what that is, they, it might be the first time they hear it, what exactly is that method? Regenerative agriculture or regenerative food systems is kind of this very, and I like regenerative food systems because it's looking at how the practice of farming can actually kind of regenerate soil, air quality, water quality, and human and community health. Farm workers are not included in a lot of other movements and like sustainable conversations when it came to agriculture. So regenerative has to, it absolutely has to look at the people working in our food system. And that's the connection back to my work on hunger and food security. And people need to have income security to have food security. When the pandemic was starting, how did you guys uh, change the operations here? We had just spent four years pouring our heart and energy into building this thing up and reviving it as a farm. And that's when we pivoted fairly quickly to, and a bunch of things that we've been experimenting with, trying to encourage people to buy our food before we showed up at the farmer's markets. We kind of made some tweaks, invited a bunch of other farmers and producers that we knew that were in the same boat, called it the virtual farmer's market, and it took off in the best of ways. <laughs> so for two years now, we've been, uh, finding ourselves running this kind of community of farmers and food lovers and doing home delivery of food for over 70 small producers. I think what's sort of been highlighted during the pandemic is, and this is pre-pandemic as well, is mm -hmm. how fragile our supply chain is here in Ontario. So I can speak to it as a small farmer. Small farms are actually most of their own supply chain. They are the growers of the food, the transporters, the salespeople, the promoters of it. So a lot of jobs that are kind of segmented in the larger systems are all done by one small farm. But the biggest challenge I see for small farms that has always existed is that like, we're all capable of growing more food. We're not capable of doing all the rest ourselves. And what I'm trying to do through Graze and Gather is say like, let's let small farmers focus on growing to their capacity and to their full potential. And somebody else, this team that's now formed, can look after the rest of that supply chain so that small farmers can still set their prices, there's still a relationship to the people that are eating it, but there's somebody else taking on kind of the messy part of the logistics, right? right?